friends, maybe we'll call ourselves to order. Very, very happy to see you here at um, our event sponsored by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship in the Medieval and Renaissance Studies Program or group. I'm Philip Barlow from the Maxwell Institute, and we are delighted to welcome Professor John Rogers from Yale University to talk with us about a latter day Milton. Uh, intriguing, but as we've already learned from some more private conversations last night and this afternoon, very rich um, hour for us to come. Uh, we'd like to remind you that now would be a good time to silence all your noise makers, if you would, your phones and such. Um, Blair Hodges, our social media guru over at the Maxwell Institute, invites us to uh, remind you to follow us through him on social media. A lot of um, things going over the Maxwell Institute in the not distant future. Uh, we will ask Janice Johnson to offer our opening prayer and then Professor Jason Kerr um, of um, Medieval and Renaissance Studies will introduce um, Professor Rogers. So Janice, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the sunshine. And we are thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here and to seek goodness and light and truth wherever it is found. We are thankful for the opportunities that we have to learn and ask thee that thy spirit be with us and that we may all learn together. We are thankful for all of the blessings that we have and the blessing that we have to be here at this university. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Rogers. Uh, he is Professor of English at Yale University. Um, in addition to many articles on early modern British literature, um, chiefly Milton, but also um, Andrew Marvell and Amelia Lanier, he's the author of a book entitled The, the Matter of Revolution, Science, Poetry, and Politics in the Age of Milton um, from Cornell University Press in 1996. And he has uh, a current project nearing completion entitled Milton's Passion on uh, the complexity of Milton's relationship with um, the events at the end of Jesus' life, the crucifixion in particular. Um, and he, the, the work he's presenting today is related to another um, ongoing book project that has to do with um, the reception of and engagement with Milton's writings in uh, 19th century American religious movements, including Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventism. Um, John is a, a kind person, a wonderful human being. Very glad to have him at BYU. Um, will you please welcome him? I can't tell you how much of a, it's a, it's an enormous treat to be here. And thank you so much, Jason, for this invitation, uh, the Maxwell Institute. I have uh, my relation to the study of Mormonism is, is uh, relatively new. And in the last uh, 72 hours, I am, I assure you, 72 times uh, smarter than I was uh, before I got here. An hour, uh, an hour ago, we just concluded at the Maxwell Institute. The, some, a, a group of distinguished scholars were looking at another piece of mine from this same larger project. And, um, and the advice that I got was bracing and inspiring, and I'm, I'm really grateful. OK. Few writers have had I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna begin with something uh, that might seem controversial. A few writers have had a greater impact on the boldest and most original aspects of the theological component of Americans' 19th century religion Mormonism than John Milton. Milton's theology, as presented in the Treatise in Christian Doctrine, and his poetry, especially Paradise Lost, left an indelible imprint on the conceptual and imaginative structures of the early Mormon doctrines of creation, the fall, and redemption. What I take to be the Miltonic resonances in the revelations of Joseph Smith, 
which John Tanner has treated so com compellingly and influentially, uh, will necessarily be of some component to this talk. But my goal here is to broaden the horizon of our understanding of the role of, however improbable, the role of John Milton in the early uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I wish in particular to emphasize the surprising extent to which Paradise Lost figured in some of the new religion's forays into theological speculation. Uh, two early apostles show every sign of having followed the prophet in attending to specific features of Milton's epic and his treatise on Christian doctrine for theological and philosophical inspiration. Um, inspiration uh, and uh, inspiration for the specific urgent project of the development of the new faith's metaphysically inclined theology. So my argument is that Milton aided the earliest attempts to unfold discursively and logically um, the meanings bound up in the Prophet Joseph's oracular utterances near the end of his life, specifically concerning the relation of matter to spirit. In the King Follett Discourse, uh, delivered shortly before his assassination, Smith seized the occasion of a funeral sermon to venture some of what I take to be some of Christianity's boldest theological speculations. The human spirit, or intelligence, he explained, not only pre-exists man's birth as a mortal human, but is actually eternal and self-existent, dependent for its creation on no one, not even God. In addition to this idea that God doesn't create man or man's spirit, but merely organizes pre-existing materials, Smith also proclaimed, no less shockingly, on the human origin of God and of the divine origin um, and the divine end of man. The sermon's oracular pronouncements on the origin of matter, of man, and even of God were at once so exciting, it seems to me, and so perplexing that his followers' eventual attempts at explication um, in the more familiar forms of theological and philosophical reasoning were surely inevitable. Also inevitable was the crisis following Smith's death involving the question of the prophet's successor. How would the church be organized in the absence of its founder? If Smith were to be replaced as president of the church, how could it be determined who would follow him? The immediate political question of church government and succession on the one hand, and on the other hand, the deeper question of the meanings of the metaphysical and cosmogonal speculations Smith delivered near the end of his life um, are both implicated in the emergence shortly after Smith's death of what has been identified, although sometimes nervously, as Mormon theology. Early Mormonism's chief theologians, um, in my view, were two of Smith's closest apostles. One was Parley P. Pratt, Books, uh, whose books, uh, Voice of Warning and Key to the Science of Theology, have long been considered among the most influential religious writings in the 19th century, for 19th century Mormonism. The second of the movement's two great theologians was Parley's younger brother, Orson, whose contribution has proven nearly as central to the new religion's beginning. If Joseph Smith can be seen as the Jesus of Mormonism, then each of the Pratt brothers can be viewed as a reasonable candidate for the role of St. Paul, the figure celebrated by the Christian church for having taken the new religious sensibility aroused by the prophet Jesus and invested it with something like a systematic philosophical rigor. The question of which brother would come to inherit the title that Edward Tullidge has called the, the St. Paul of Mormondom will be one of the considerations of this talk. Given that it is so often the case, as in life, as in literature, that the younger is the more interesting of a pair of brothers. My focus will rest on the younger of the two theologically minded Pratt brothers. Both Pratts were, of course, students of the prophet Joseph, and both show every sign as well of having been avid readers of the poet prophet Milton. But it would be Orson, in the care and zeal with which he attempted to interweave the truths he gleaned from both of those teachers, especially in his metaphys metaphysical treatise, uh, Great First Cause, um, or the self-moving forces of the universe. Um, it's, it's Orson who, who would most fully ascend, this is what I'm hoping to convince you of, fully ascend to the imaginative heights scaled by the prophet Joseph Smith and the poet John Milton. 
Let's consider first the succession crisis that shook the church, lasting for like at least three years after the prophet's death. Who in the wake of Joseph Smith's assassination would be promoted to lead the church? Would it be the two surviving members of the first presidency? Would it be the aggregate triumvirate of a reorganized first presidency with a new president installed? Might it be the larger senatorial gathering of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles who could, through the power of consensus, guide the infant faith? Or more broadly, would the church's presidency devolve, devolve to the even more representative body of then the Council of 50 or the Quorum of the 70, yet wider groupings that stood beneath the Quorum of the 12? The crisis was intensified in part by the confusion surrounding one of the revelations concerning ecclesiastical organization that Joseph Smith had shared with his followers around the time of the establishment of the quorums in 1835. We read, for example, uh, in Smith's Revelation, as transcribed in Doctrine and Covenants uh, 107, that the 12 Mormon apostles form a quorum equal in authority and power to the three presidents who constitute the church's uh, first presidency. The quorum of the 70, furthermore, is equal in authority to that of the 12. Uh, just a few lines down, however, in verse 33, we learn that it was also revealed to Smith that the 12 are a traveling presiding high council to officiate in the name of the Lord under the direction of the presidency of the church. So on the one hand, uh, the quorum of the 70 is equal to the quorum of the 12, which is itself equal to the presidency. And on the other hand, uh, the quorum of the 12 serve under the direction of the presidency. Uh, the revelation about church organization appeared to be conflictive. And according to Gary James Bergera, whose uh, work, Conflict in the Quorum, I'm, I'm reliant on, reasonable arguments were made for the original Mormon prophet's anticipation of his succession by the 70, by the 12, the three, or by a single newly named president himself. The succession crisis was long and drawn out, spanning much of the time uh, in, the, in which the saints marched westward to Utah. The three-man first presidency under Smith had been dissolved shortly after Joseph's death. Um, almost immediately, the chief governing body of the church became the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, of whom the charismatic Brigham Young was president. Well, officially, it was the 12-man quorum itself that served collectively as the faith's uh, governing authority, Brigham Young, as Bergera has explained, had assumed de facto presidency of the church by virtue of his position as the president of the quorum. Uh, for, Berg uh, for Bergera, Young labored to make as manifest as possible his fitness to lead the church, citing Joseph Smith's example, his revelations, and the practical realities of church governance. At the end of 1847, Young made a bid in a conclave of the apostles for a formal reorganization of the first presidency with himself at the helm. It was Orson Pratt who argued the most strenuously for the ongoing governance of the church by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, while Brigham Young continued to assert what he took to be the self-evident eminence of his own position. On the basis of what can we say that the 17th century English poet John Milton played an important role in the thinking of the church's earliest members. For some, it may be uh, sufficient uh, merely to point out Joseph Smith's direct engagement with one of the most famous lines of Paradise Lost uh, when he writes of the Mormon practice of the baptism of the dead, that it justifies the ways of God to man. Uh, but the evidence of the ties that Smith uh, and some of his closest apostles had to Milton is much de deeper, I will be suggesting, um, than that simple echo might suggest. It has long been established that Milton was one of the most widely read and passionately revered poets in 18th and early 19th century America. That a significant number of educated US readers in that period were intimately familiar with Paradise Lost has been amply demonstrated. What scholars of the reception of Milton have never acknowledged, though, is the zeal with which passionate but less educated readers in the late 18th and early 19th centuries approached the work of England's premier epic poet. How might these zealous but less sophisticated readers gain access to what some of you will know is Milton's uh, devilishly difficult poem. Uh, readers whose goal was to expose themselves 
to the stories of disobedience and redemption treated so scantily in the Bible had several ways of reading Paradise Lost just for the plot. Uh, there were, and these are all in print form, uh, versions of the poem that straightened out Milton's syntax, rendering the epic into what is known as grammatical construction, uh, versions of the po uh, Milton's poem that not only placed Milton's inverted syntax into the natural order, but also translated it into prose as well. You see here four lines of verse translated into prose uh, below. Uh, there are abridgments that remove from the flow of the narrative the similes and other challenging, but in terms of the plot, <coughs> in terms of the Christian message, um, uh, these are just um, inessential ornaments. There are editions whose glosses ignored all of the classical references and emphasize only the poem's <laughs> biblical sources. Uh, the official Methodist version of Paradise Lost in 1763, an extract from Milton's Paradise Lost with notes, um, in which John Wesley himself, one of the founders of Methodism, in which John Wesley explains that he has omitted those lines which I despaired of explaining to the unlearned without using abundance of words, um, making this excellent poem clear and intelligible to any uneducated person of a tolerable good understanding. <laughs> Happily, this edition is available now in paperback um, in a volume titled, I love this, Milton for the Methodists. <laughs> Uh, we also have the Methodists to thank for the most popular of the simplified versions of Paradise Lost. Um, 1830 saw the American publication for the Sunday School Union of the Methodist Episcopal Church of Eliza Weaver Bradburn's popular Story of Paradise Lost for Children, uh, which features a mother reading an abridged version of the poem to her children, offering each of the kids a solidly Methodist answer to their many questions about the most puzzling moments in the story. As we will see, the, the Pratt brothers were both fully immersed in the poetry of Paradise Lost and in the heterodox speculations comprising Milton's newly discovered treatise on Christian doctrine, whose notoriety as a heretical document accompanied its much publicized U.S. printing in 1826. It has naturally been suggested uh, before that Joseph Smith was moved by Milton's vigorous defense of polygamy's ongoing uh, favor in the eyes of God. This is in chapter 10 of Milton's theological treatise. The manuscript of Milton's treatise had been unaccounted for until its discovery in 1823, but it was quickly, quickly edited, quickly translated by Charles Sumner, and published as a treatise on Christian doctrine in London in 1825, and then in Boston in 1826. The treatise's shocking heresies producing a scandal among many of Milton's polite 19th century readers, uh, uh, produced a scandal among his polite readers um, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic in the 19th century. The fact of the poet's approval of polygamy became widely known throughout Protestant America in 1826 through numerous local newspapers, church periodicals, all of which rushed to cover the story of the great Milton's wayward theology of marriage. Um, as BYU's own John Tanner has made clear, and I'm honored to have John Tanner in this room, um, we cannot doubt that the early apostle, apostles were familiar with the treatise on Christian doctrine. In the first intellectual uh, defense of, the Mormon, of Mormon polygamy in 1853, Orson Pratt drew many of his arguments from chapter 10 of Milton's notorious treatise. Orson's uh, Oh, this is it. Orson, Orson's overseas periodical, The Latter-day Saints Millennial Star, would offer a verbatim reprint of Milton's long argument, very long and very detailed argument about polygamy, in two successive issues in 1854. A couple of decades later, the Mormon readers of The Millennial Star would be further urged to read not only Milton's discussion of polygamy and the Christian doctrine, but I'm quoting, the whole work itself. The prolific Pratt brothers had put themselves in conversation with some of the most notable metaphysicians of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, but their metaphysical speculations were always mediated but by what we can only assume was the total immersion in the poetry, theology, and metaphysics of Milton's Paradise Lost and the treatise on Christian doctrine. Uh, the Metaphysics of Creation in Orson Pratt's Great First Cause, or The Self-Moving Forces of the Universe, emerges as a complex engagement with Milton's account of Raphael's description of Adam. 
in Book Five of Paradise Lost. Um, Raphael's description of the monistic continuity between the material substances of heaven and those of earth. Spirit is material, just as some matter is spiritual. And the ontologically unified spiritualized matter, uh, constitutive of both heaven and earth, has its ultimate origin in God. This is the angel, the narrating angel Raphael in uh, speaking to Adam. O oh, Adam, one almighty is, from whom all things proceed and up to him return, if not depraved from good. Created all such to perfection, one first matter all. Endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life, but more refined, more spiritous, and pure. The substance constitutive of, uh, constitutive of both heaven and earth derives from the same source of original substance. Raphael calls it one first matter all. That's his remarkable phrase uh, that he uses to identify the origins of all things earthly and all things heavenly in the original substance from which the one almighty created both heaven and earth. Uh, what we call spirit is but an elevated form of matter, more refined, more spiritous, and pure. And the whole of creation can be imagined as spanning a vertical continuum from the least refined, least spiritous substance on the bottom of the scale of nature and the most refined, most spiritous substance at the top. The poem's metaphysics have been almost entirely ignored uh, by, or neglected by Milton's learned readers for the 150 or so years after its initial publication. It wasn't until the 19th century discovery of the theological discovery of the treatise, which expands these ideas considerably, that Milton has begun to seem interesting, or had begun to seem interesting, really for the first time, as a philosopher of matter. The prophet Joseph, who in all likelihood uh, began reading, this is, uh, this is my conjecture, began reading Paradise Lost in 1842, perhaps alongside the Pratt brothers in something like a school of the prophets, uh, attends closely to the, angels Raphael, the angel Raphael's account of the identity of matter and spirit. He explains in 1843 that all spirit is matter. There is no such thing as immaterial matter. All spirit is matter, but it is more fine or pure. The Miltonic idea that man is made of the same stuff as angels may well have been exhilarating for Smith. If drawn out logically to an extreme, it could ennoble all human action, supplying an almost metaphysical foundation for any aspiration that man, man might have to godhood. But Joseph Smith is an infinitely bolder visionary than John Milton, and he wisely ignores what Milton writes next. The poet is compelled to put the brakes on any suggestion that all spiritualized matter could eventually climb its way to heaven. The extent of any particular thing or any being's upward ontological mobility is limited by some, for Milton, some form of predetermination, as Raphael explains just after identifying the origin of all things in the, in the one first matter. Each in their several active spheres assigned, so everything doesn't get to the rise at the top at the, to the same degree. Uh, each in their several active spheres assigned till body up to spirit work in bounds proportioned to each kind. Raphael concludes his paean to the beautiful monistic continuum of Miltonic creation with this, I don't know, after reading uh, Early Mormons, this seems very small-minded, this limited insistence on what is ultimately creation's ontological circumscription. All created things we learn in these uh, final three lines of this passage of Raphael's, this metaphysical disquisition, have been assigned by their creator uh, specific hierarchically segregated spheres of being, appointed specific bounds proportioned to each kind. Apostle Orson Pratt follows Smith in uh, engaging with Milton's poem as a seedbed, as I see it, of language and ideas about the metaphysics of the purer, more refined material substance known as spirit. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Joseph. No, this is Orson. There is another material spirit called, I'm sorry, there is another material substance called spirit of a more refined nature, possessing some properties in common with other matter and other qualities far superior to other matter. 
Further yet, Pratt, while modernizing Milton's metaphysics with wonderful references to post-Miltonic discoveries, such as that of electricity, takes Raphael's phrase, one first matter, and transmutes it into the, and admittedly, it's a homelier phrase, but nonetheless, it's a version, I think, um, one elementary simple substance I take to be Orson Pratt's version of Raphael's uh, original substance. All the ponderable substances of nature together with light, heat, and electricity, and even spirit itself, all originated from one elementary simple substance possessing a living, self-moving force with intelligence sufficient to govern it in all its infinitude of combinations and operations, producing all of the immense variety of phenomena constantly taking place throughout the wide domains of universal nature. Orson Pratt, it has to be said, is no slavish disciple of Milton. He moves far beyond the poet's vision of, uh, of what he calls the one elementary simple substance, um, a living self-moving force, Milton wouldn't have uh, gone there, with intelligence sufficient to, to govern it in all its infinitude of combinations and operations, producing all of the immense variety of phenomena. Okay, so how did, for Orson Pratt, the one elementary simple substance produce all of the immense variety of phenomena of creation? Uh, Pratt's version of the one first matter populated the world with the diversity of creation, uh, this is what I want to suggest here, in imitation, at least in part, of Raphael's explanation of the boundaries and constraints, initially, the boundaries and constraints by which the spiritually hierarchized matter is organized. I'm, I'm uh, sorry about that. You should have seen that earlier. Um, mm. I don't know if they have this. Um, there is a law given to all things according to their capacities. This is uh, Orson Pratt. Their wisdom, their knowledge, and their advance in the grand school of the universe. So he's imagining a kind of initial segregation uh, or class. But while Pratt follows Milton in this mention of the constraints limiting the upward mobility of different forms of being, he clearly exceeds Raphael's vision of the universe when he insists on matter's capacity to overleap those hierarchically assigned boundaries when that matter virtuously and intelligently, as he puts it, keeps the law. To every law, I'm sorry, to every law, there are bounds and conditions set. So I take that to be an initial engagement with Milton. And those materials that continue within their own sphere of action and keep the law are exalted to new spheres of action. They're promoted or elevated or uh, uh, exalted. In stark violation of the ontological limitations that Raphael describes in Paradise Lost when noting the assignment of all things to their differentiated active spheres, Orson Pratt permits materials in his metaphysical vision to be exalted to new spheres of action when they have served their appointed times. What, for Smith, permits this remarkable exaltation from one seemingly segregated rung of the ladder of nature to another is the capacity of matter to keep the law. As he writes in his essay on the pre-existence of man, if the spiritual par particles of matter abide the laws and conditions of its several states of existence, is that not there? I'm sorry about this. Um, Abide the laws and conditions of its several states of existence, who shall say, Orson Pratt argues, that it will not progress until it shall gain the very summit of perfection um, and exist in all the glorious beauty of the image of God. Baser matter is not consigned, as it is in Milton's poem, um, to remain within its appointed sphere. Base, more substantial matter for the American Pratt is eminently educable and capable of advancement, um, though its exaltation to higher spheres of being will require, re require according to Pratt, um, a period of suffering and something like a metaphysical purgatory if it fails to abide the laws and conditions of the several states of matter. It would be reasonable to assume that Orson Pratt intends us to imagine God having imposed on the world of spiritualized matter the physical laws that his conscious, conscientious, and surprisingly ethical um, material particles are expected to obey. 
but Pratt hastens to uh, correct any such assumption, since in his vision, the elements of matter, which only move when they move themselves, don't just obey. They actually prescribe the physical laws by which they willingly bind themselves. In refuting the notion embraced by nearly all of his metaphysical contemporaries, of course, uh, who argue, for the most part, that matter is inert um, and implicitly unintelligent, Orson Pratt explains the logical necessity of matter's fundamental intelligence and then accounts for the process by which the conscious, intelligent, self-moving particles of matter produce in their obedient and orderly fashion all the immense variety of creation's uh, phenomena. Okay, here, this slide is now relevant. <laughs> they prescribe laws for their own action. These are the microparticles of the universe. An unintelligent particle is incapable of understanding and obeying a law, while an intelligent particle is capable of both understanding and obedience. It would be entirely useless for an intelligent cause to give laws to unintelligent matter, for such matter could never become conscious of such laws. All of this seems logically irrefutable, and therefore would be totally incapable of obedience. It is evident that each particle must have not only perceived the utility of such laws, but must have con mutually consented to obey them in the most strict and invariable manner. It is their obedience to these physical laws of their own design for which the intelligent particles of matter are rewarded, or actually I think we have to imagine them rewarding themselves with exaltation from sphere to sphere. The study of physics then is for Orson Pratt, uh, but a testimony to the intelligence and the virtue of the elements of matter, uh, as in his truly remarkable account of how and why it is that matter obeys Newton's law of gravity. This uh, blows me away. All of these self-moving materials must be possessed of a high degree of intelligence in order to obey with such perfect and undeviating exactness the innumerable laws which obtain in the universe. What depth of knowledge, for instance, is requisite in order for particles to obey the single law of gravitation. Each particle must not, must not only know of the exact quantity of matter existing in all directions from itself, but must also know its exact distance from every other particle, that it may know during every moment how to regulate the intensity and the direction of its own motions, according to the law of the inverse square of the distance. This is beautiful. Obedience to this one law on the part of material particles requires in them a degree of intelligence far beyond our utmost comprehension. Aided by just such an account of the physical law, far wilder, sure, than even Newton's really crazy al alchemical uh, musings, that Orson Pratt articulates his powerful rejection of mechanistic modern physics. Matter can in no way be seen as inert, inanimate, or in Pratt's words, much, more, much better word, unintelligent. Even an unswerving law such as Newton's of gravity functions for Orson Pratt as proof of the intellectual self-possession and also the moral probity of every particle of matter. For Joseph Smith, the most important pre-existing element was the spirit of man, over which Smith's God could assert no rights as creator. In the 1844 King Follett discourse, Smith makes clear that man, or at least the spirit of man, is as old as God himself. God found himself, um, as you know, Smith explains, in his own account of the origins of the divine being as we know it, God found himself in the midst of spirits and glory. If for Smith, the co-eternity of God and the material spirit of man was a belief to be asserted with oracular certainty, for Orson Pratt, it was a doctrine to be explained and argued for with the tools of logic. And in his I take it to be a kind of shocking midrash on Smith's King Follett discourse, Orson outpaces in conceptual courage Joseph's already daring sense of God's creation is little more than the organization or rearrangement of pre-existing spiritual matter. Um, in great first cause, the organization of pre-existing matter wasn't the necessary, it wasn't necessarily the work of any creator God. All the org and I know this looks awkward there, there's some uh, gaps. Uh, we'll see if they get filled in. Um, all the organizations of worlds, of minerals, of vegetables, of animals, he tells us, were the product not of God's creating hand, 
They came about rather, and not of God's organizational hand, um, they came about rather as the result of the self combinations and unions of the pre existent, intelligent, powerful, and eternal particles of substance. The internally existent elements themselves, having moved on from a mastery of the basics of self motion, and Orson Pratt actually teaches us in Great First Cause how, at the beginning of, uh, for, well, for eons, because they've been eternally there, every particle of matter was static, just stayed put. Um, each one, over we, how many thousands of years, we don't know, each one teaches itself how to, how to move, and then, of course, learns or teaches itself the laws of physics that it itself creates. Um, and the, the, the self-education vision is um, the autodidacticism of these particles of matter is just extraordinary. The eternally existence elements themselves, having moved on from a mastery of the basics of self-motion to the higher learning of cohesion and repulsion, united and combined themselves into the material world as we know it. Orson Pratt, it seems to me, is pushing at the limits of what is possible to imagine and assert. But that shows you how much I know. Um, Pratt has no intention of stopping, and he presses his case Yet further, in this amazing, uh, what follows, denying God any claim to the creation organization or organization of men, of angels, of spirits, which he explains were also themselves but the product of the unions and the self combinations of the intelligent eternal matter. Smith's King Follett discourse has long and rightly been held up as one of the most exuberant visions of heavenly existence ever proposed. But for me, uh, Orson Pratt's first great cause of 1851 has to be viewed, at least in some ways, as outstripping the prophet's own account of the origin of things, at least in terms of what it permits itself to picture and explain. If not the fall at sermon, what then could have inspired Pratt not only to imagine, but actually to assert as a formal point of belief the idea that uh, that the creation or the organization of men and angels emerge as the consequence of the glorious self-motion of pre-existent matter. It goes without saying that we can find no such imagining in any contemporary cosmology. Pratt was reading, um, as, he, uh, and, and Pratt was reading as he prepared Great First Cause um, everything he could get his hands on. Uh, and he argues with all of those uh, contemporary cosmologists uh, aggressively and vigorously. Uh, nor could Matt Milton's radically monistic, but nonetheless theocentric treatise on Christian doctrine have offered Orson Pratt anything like an understanding of the mystery of self-creation. We have nowhere else to turn. This, this is my gambit. Uh, we have nowhere else to turn, but that episode of Paradise Lost featuring a debate about creation that I want to suggest here helps shape some of Orson's most startling uh, theological speculation. In the Epics Book Five, in Milton's wholly original account of, oh, okay, wholly original account of the crisis of authority and the celestial polity that preceded the war in heaven, the father calls to assembly all the sons of heaven and announces the anointing of his, his great vicegerent and his successor. A still sinless Satan, however, could not bear to pride that sight and thought himself impaired. And it's with this wounded sense of impairment that Satan resolves to leave unworshipped, I'm quoting Milton here, unobeyed the throne supreme, and to call his followers to reject what he characterizes as the son of God's um, unjustifiable usurpation of power. The father and the newly anointed son of God of paradise lost are not without their angelic supporters. Loyalists who clearly reject Satan's interpretation of the son's exaltation as an unjust assumption of authority. Chief among the loyalists is the, is the zealous angel Abdiel, who takes Satan to task for daring to question God's choice of a successor. On what grounds, Abdiel asks in the poem, does Satan dare to question the creative father who made thee what thou art and formed the powers of heaven such as he pleased? On what ground, Abiel continues, can Satan question the authority of the Son of God, the being by whom, as by his word, 
the mighty Father made all things, even thee, and all the spirits of heaven by him created in their bright degrees, crowned them with glory. So Abdiel issues the claim here that not only the Father formed or created the angels, but they, that he did so by the means of the Son. One has no choice but to obey one's creator. Um, look at Satan's response to Abdiel's claim that the angels are dependent for their creation um, on both the Father and the Son. Uh, Satan is appalled by Abdiel's sanctimonious and priggish piety. That we were formed then, sayst thou, in the work of secondary hands by task transferred from father to his son? Strange point and new. Doctrine which we would know whence learned, who saw when this creation was. Rememberst thou thy making? While the maker gave thee being, we know no time when we were not as now, know none before us, self-begot, self-raised, by our own quickening power. All readers of Paradise Lost have always agreed, I think, that there is no more blasphemous or heretical utterance anywhere in the poem. Milton's 19th century readers were especially appalled by the satanic insistence that the angels are not created, but that they're self-existent. Yet it's this very assertion by Milton Satan of self-creation that I'm suggesting here, plants itself at the conceptual foundation of Orson Pratt's theologico-metaphysical account of origins in the great first cause, or the self-moving forces of the universe. To be sure, Pratt doesn't situate Satan's woefully unamplified claim uh, directly in the treatise. Uh, a better logician than Satan, Orson Pratt is, and he knows he cannot tell that the he cannot tell us that the angels are self-begot or self-raised. It doesn't make any sense. What self or coherent unit of identity and subjectivity could possibly exist to precede an action of creation responsible for laying the very foundation of that self? Pratt's version of the satanic denial of God's responsibility for the creation of angels clears up that lapse into absurdity on Satan's part and posits a creative agent, or rather, of course, innumerable creative agents, distinct from the angelic self, that emerges fully formed from the creative process undertaken by the infinitesimal particles of matter. It is a myriad of pre-existent, intelligent, powerful, and eternal particles of substance um, who at some particular point in time decided con consensually for Pratt to apply their newly acquired capacities for cohesive union and combination to constitute through aggregation the joint venture that becomes every individual heavenly angel. Each angel, man and spirit, in Orson Pratt's vision, is a fundamentally corporate entity, an elaborate unit not conjured magically by an omnipotent god, nor even organized from pre-existing materials as by uh, the creator god of the prophet. But by what we have to assume is the more politic, uh, maybe more democratic means of the innumerable decisions, movements, and actions undertaken by each of the fully distinct and individuated atomic particles participating in this massive group effort of consensual will. In offering his own, what I take to be more logically sustainable version of the satanic myth of angelic self-creation, Pratt redeems the central ontological heresy providing the intellectual justification for the disastrous rebellion in the heaven of paradise lost. Orson Pratt is of the devil's party, uh, <laughs> maybe without knowing it, but probably knowing it. <laughs> Could this mid 19th century American theologian, theologian slash metaphysician possibly go any further? The answer of course is yes. <laughs> Orson Pratt completes his sweeping reconfiguration of our understanding of the material universe with a final, yet more shocking extension of his vision of creation as the product of the decentered consensual congregation of distinct material particles. God, he avers, is himself a creature. Um, let us return to the previously cited sentence from the great first cause, and we can now fill in all the blanks. God himself is but a belated effect of matter's capacity to combine and unify or unite itself 
into meaningful formations. The spiritual personages of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost must, if organized at all, have been the result of the self-combinations and unions of the pre-existent, intelligent, powerful, and eternal particles of substance. Think of that. The personage of the Father in heaven, along with the personages of the Son of God and the Holy Ghost, are in the end denied anything like a stable, self-existent ontology. Um, are there any such instances in the Judeo-Christian tradition in which a major theologian denies the eternity of God. No such eternal deity exists for Orson Pratt as the figure known as, now we have to put quotation marks around him, as God is but a historically contingent union of the most intelligent particles of the universe. Um, the deity is demoted from cause to effect, an entirely contingent consequence of, and I'm quoting uh, Pratt here, anterior and eternal powers of each individual particle, comprising a godlike being. Pratt's God is less a deity than what we can call a deity effect. Um, a contingent union, a union with a beginning, and two very likely an ending um, in the universe uh, uh, of the powers embodied in what are for him the only truly eternal beings, the pre-existent, intelligent, powerful uh, particles of substance. And these microparticles are, these eternal forces are the great first causes of all things and events that have had a beginning. Uh, the great first cause is the, is the, is the atom. Um, these particles are the wise and all-knowing creator of God. So as I noted in face of the strong opposition of Orson Pratt himself, Brigham Young was in 1847 striving to establish himself as the president of the church, the holder of the keys to, of the priesthood, including the, 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 the key that seals salvation itself. As he asserts repeatedly, he was called to that office by God himself. Later, he, uh, it, 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 it's, it's the Holy Spirit. But at this, at this juncture, it's God. It was surely no coincidence that it was in the same year at the height of the succession battle with, uh, with Brigham Young, that Orson Pratt first publicly speculated in a sermon about the role of the infinitesimal particles of intelligent matter in the original organization of the being who became God. So I suggest that we take seriously the possibility that the politically beleaguered Orson Pratt turns to the discursive world of metaphysical and theological speculation. It's a privileged language. It's a, it's a safe space in which decidedly non-metaphysical, non-theological matters of uh, political ecclesiology can be questioned and proposed. Brigham Young certainly understood as much, knowing full well that theology and metaphysics could function as a politically resonant field of symbolic expression. In response to Orson Pratt's suggestion of the temporal finitude of the almost makeshift personhood of the gods, um, Brigham Young only worked harder to affirm the self-existence of the deity, coming close at times to an unlikely formulation almost akin to Orthodox Christianity, coming close um, with its grounding vision of an eternal creator God. Um, and this is, uh, Brigham Young is reported to have said uh, at this moment, there never was a time or eternity, but what a God did exist. Likewise, as Orson Pratt pushed for the disintegration of the newly orthodox Mormon godhead into its constituent parts of divinized particles of matter, Brigham Young only increased his investment in the idea of God's status as fully individuated, self-sufficient person. An anthropomorphism so strong that, as, 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 as you know, if, uh, Young eventually developed the theory that God was none other than Adam and Adam God, both the father of all humankind and in the pantheon of gods, its reigning deity. The concept of the eternal self-existent personhood of God supplied the conceptual basis for Brigham Young's implicit justification of his own authority to preside over the church and eventually to preside in heaven as well. Um, and this is, uh, uh, Brigham Young is uh, re recorded as having said this. In a, I was begotten by the God I worship who reigns in the heavens, and I shall also in my turn reign as a God. Uh, Young responded to Pratt's politicized theology 
with a politicized theology of his own. Okay, enter finally the older of the Pratt brothers. Offering President Young his services as a writer and as a theologian and metaphysician, Orson Pratt's brother Parley would provide a philosophical defense of the new Mormon presidency by countering his brother's great first cause with a metaphysical theology designed to champion rather than to disintegrate uh, the God who had personally called Brigham Young to his position of power in the church. Within two years of Orson's publication of Great First Cause, uh, Parley had written The Key to the Science of Theology. Um, it's uh, written in 1853 and published in 1855, in which many of Orson's most corrosive philosophical positions were countered with a much, I, I think, much less unsettling, more comfortably orthodox Mormonism. It must be said that Parley never embraced and he gets, in my, to, you know, from the perspective of a Miltonist, he gets a lot of points for this. He never embraces the, the traditional Christian, indeed Western, understanding of a kind of oppositional divide between body and soul or matter and spirit. Both of, of the Pratt brothers are always attuned to Joseph Smith's, what I take to be his Miltonic claim, that all spirit is matter, but it is more fine and pure. But Parley is unequivocal in his rejection of Orson's libertarian vision of a decentralized cosmos in which gods, angels, and men are all utterly free and self-determining. Um, he comes down especially hard, it would seem, on Orson's ecstatic claim. Orson writes, all gods are equal. If there are gods, they are all equal in power, in glory, in dominion, and they are all in possession of all things. Um, the gods were by no means equal in Parley's defense of President Brigham Young's vision of cosmological hierarchy. Over them all, over, uh, over them all, Parley will insist, and what strikes me as an unmistakable exposure of the political subtext lurking beneath the surface of the early Mormon theological speculation that we've been examining. Over them all, Parley says, there is a presidency or grand head who is the father of all. And next to him is Jesus Christ, the eldest born and first heir of all the realms of light. Parley's accepted a lot of uh, Orson's fundamentally liberal physical universe. The material uh, elements that make up all things are intelligent and self-moving for the older brother, and most of the discernible phenomena of the material world can be explained in terms of the language. The material particle of talk. <laughs> Doubts of the blasphemy of the talk. Um, uh, Parley's elementary uh, particles must perform their actions only by, and this is how he differs. Um, oh, this is how he differs from Orson, obviously. Only by, and I'm quoting, by consent and authority of the head. In fact, Parley had fashioned the symbolic structure of his theological science in such a way as to resound analogically, it seems to me, with Brigham Young's claim to have been divinely authorized by a personal, decidedly self-existent God to assume the Mormon presidency. Orson had, much to Young's dismay, argued for the almost utter lack of integrity in the person uh, of that deity known as the Holy Spirit. This, uh, their, their, their feud moves from God, a kind of father God, uh, to the Holy Spirit. For Orson, the eternally wise particles that filled the personal tabernacle of the Holy Spirit were indistinguishable from the particles that filled the personal tabernacle of any human being. Uh, Parley counters this uh, by arguing that the Holy Spirit is under the control of the great Elohim. The particles of the Holy Spirit may be for Parley, as they were for Orson, widely diffused among the other elements of space, but they are not left entirely on their own to cohere and unite at will to produce new, produce new organized creations. The work of creation, according to Parley, must be left. Oh, rats. I don't have this, um, uh, but it's good. I think it's good. The work of creation, according to Parley, must be left to, and I'm quoting, a general assembly, quorum, or grand council of the gods. It is that assembled body acting not independently, as Brother Orson might have speculated, but with their presidency as their head that constitutes the designing and cre creating power of Parley Pratt's vision of the universe. Despite Parley's 
dogged metaphysical efforts at reconsolidating the power of the one presidential God in his work, The Key to the Science of Theology. Nonetheless, President Brigham Young would continue to feel the threat of the libertarian ecclesiological energies unleashed by Orson Pratt's speculative metaphysics in The Great First Cause and other writings. As late as 1865, um, Brigham Young would take the time to print in both the Deseret News and the Millennial Star a formal proclamation of the First Presidency um, and the Twelve. In stern rebuke of Orson's, at this point, it's a 15-year-old theory that each individual atomic particle of God's material being was an all-wise, all-powerful, um, possessing the same knowledge and the same truth. The Great First Cause and other uh, publications by Brother Orson Young publicly proclaimed, contain doctrines which we cannot sanction and which we have felt impressed to disown so that the saints who now live and who may live hereafter may not be misled by our silence or be left to misinterpret it. Brother Orson, for, uh, as Brigham Young so beautifully explains, has launched forth on an endless sea launched forth on an endless sea of speculation to which there is no horizon. Um, immediately following the, this 1865 rebuke was a formal printed retraction by a downcast Orson himself, who embraced the present opportunity of publicly expressing my most sincere regret that I have ever published the least thing which meets with the disapprobation of the highest authorities of the church. We recall that in Book 5 of Paradise Lost, it was an apparent succession crisis that spurred the thrilling speculative energy fueling the debate between Satan and Abdiel concerning the creation of the angels. In that section of the poem, the pressing political matter at hand was the obligation in heaven to acknowledge and obey a newly exalted heavenly authority, the Son of God. In the end, the debate between the loyalist angel Abdiel and the rebel angel Satan did not center itself exclusively in a direct or unmediated language of political obligation or resistance. Um, the question or the question of the political obligation to obey the, the Son of God moves quickly to a question of the ontological obligation to obey him. God had formed the angels. Abdiel insisted, and he had done so by means of the Son of God, in the face of Abdiel's seemingly undeniable ontological justification of the creaturely obligation to obey not only the Father, but also the Son of God as well, Satan, Satan brilliantly, and of course self-destructively, conjured a competing ontological vi vision that denied the Father's agency in his creation. The angels were self-begot, as we remember, self-raised by their own quickening power. Uh, oh, oh, that's, um, that's the retraction. It was a version of the radically liberal political structure logically entailed by the satanic metaphysics of self-creation that Orson Pratt labored not just to, uh, not just to represent, but actually to champion in his cosmogonal, theogonal masterpiece, Great First Cause. Having suffered a number of rebukes and reprimands from Brigham Young for pressing his critique of Young's reestablishment of the first presidency, Orson Pratt had no room by 1851 in which to continue the fight with Young and his supporters on anything like explicitly political or ecclesiological grounds. Brigham Young had unequivocally won the succession battle. The president and not the quorum of the 12 would function as the chief's new governor. The more, the most, the more straightforward discursive realm of political and of, of politics and of ecclesiology are obviously closed to Orson Pratt. So he turns to cosmology with what degree of self-consciousness we cannot know. And he fashioned with the tools of a materialist metaphysics an almost fantasy world of creaturely self-determination, a world liberated from impingement by anything that, is, that smacks of authoritarian control. In uncanny recognition 
of his brother's assumption of Satan's intellectual subject position in Book Five of Paradise Lost, Parley Pratt, and I, I'm, I'm on thin ice here, I, I totally get that. Parley Pratt effortlessly assumes the role of Satan's authoritative foil, Satan's brother, uh, or fellow son of God, Abdiel. Loyal to Brigham Young, Parley, in what must be read as his pointed response to Great First Cause, makes an Abdielian ontological argument in his key to the science of theology for the necessity of the political allegiance to the new regime. The metaphysical speculations of the first generations of Mormon theologians could not be disentangled from the political ecclesiological questions that pressed themselves on the saints after the death of Joseph Smith to justify the ways of God's church, was to justify the, way, was to justify the ways of God, to justify the ways of God in the heady intellectual climate of early Mormonism, was to justify the ways of matter and spirit. Surely it was at least in part Parley's political loyalty to Brigham Young, as well as his corresponding metaphysical uh, vision of a theocentrically governed cosmos that explains his ascendancy as the new religion's chief theologian. The Abdiels of the world inherit the earth, or at least the heavens, as surely both Pratt brothers came to recognize upon Brigham Young's blessing of the superior loyalty of Parley. I'll just, this is, this is Orson. I'm, we're just going to end with the picture. Um, Orson Pratt's grace first cause would be denied the new president's benediction, and as we uh, have seen, would need in 1865 to be retracted altogether, while the more disciplined key to the science of theology would establish itself as a central work of Mormon doctrine, going through nine editions and selling 30,000 copies by 1884. It was Parley, we have to assume, who would in the end, by means perhaps of his uh, superior caution, his loyalty, makes the strongest claim for El Edward Tullidge's title of Apostle Paul of Mormondom. And in fact, Terrell Givens and Matthew Groh's subtitle for their biography of Parley is the Apostle Paul of Mormonism. So Parley gets the exalted title, and Orson gets cast down. But Orson Pratt earns our respect for the poetry of his philosophy. Um, he earns our respect for having, in Brigham Young's truly beautiful words, launched forth on an endless sea of speculation to which there is no horizon. Thank you very much. I'm hopeful uh, that there might be some questions. Denunciations are fine too. <laughs> oh, yes. How was uh, Orson Pratt's uh, argument different from Satan? Orson, uh, okay, that's, that's a great, it's a great question. Uh, how was Orson Pratt's argument different from Satan's. So Satan says, we created ourselves. We're self-begot, self-raised. Orson Pratt doesn't fall into that trap. Who is the self that creates, the, how can you be a self that creates your own self? Um, Orson Pratt produces ingeniously and entirely different, that lower caste of creators, the microparticles of the intelligent, miraculously uh, self-moving and, and self-obeying particles of, the, of, of universal matter. Um, in a consensual act of aggregational will, um, they come together and form a man, an angel, and it turns out even, even a, a, a deity. So I, I, I think there's a little more logical coherence to Orson's, uh, the Orson's vision than there is to, uh, to Satan's. I, I, you know, it's, I, which is more pious or, I, you know, they're, they're both pretty out there. And they were both designed to be offensive, I, I have to assume. Um, uh, yes? Uh, I'm just wondering how you um, came to want to write about this. What was your impact? What were your main inspirations for writing this? <laughs> I love John Milton. And <laughs> I love the idea that a lot of other people love the poetry of, of Paradise Lost. Um, I've told this story a couple of times over the, the last couple of days, but 
I don't know, there have been um, a few different circuitous paths. One was the Mormon channel that I was flipping through in a hotel once uh, many years ago. <laughs> and I you know, was scrolling through all the things that I could watch, and one of them was this documentary on uh, the Passion, Jesus' Last Hours. And it's extraordinary. It's just a monologue. He's sitting, and he's just soliloquizing. Uh, and he's explain, explaining to himself for speculating about what it means that he's in this position, what it is about he's to, what it, he's about to do, and what the consequences will be. And uh, we, we, we end, I believe, before we actually get to the crucifixion. And I was slack-jawed. Uh, I couldn't imagine that whoever put together this docudrama hadn't read the sequel to Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, in which Milton imagines the redemption in a kind of you know pre-Mormon way, as happening uh, without any of the sacramental or uh, magical efforts or work of of, a, of an atonement, um, it's the simple ethical resistance of temptation. Uh, this docudrama seemed to be suggest maybe he had taken maybe the writer had taken um, a Milton class with John Tanner. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, after that, I just, um, I, I began looking for, somehow I, I found Orson Pratt, and then I realized I had discovered a personal hero. And I, 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 I think I found, um, for me, uh, someone who is so wildly um, daring in his ability to speculate beyond all bounds and beyond all appropriate or decorous limits. It's a uh, I, I don't know who else will go that far in, you know, in what is still a recognizable-ish uh, theological vein. Anyway. Uh, yes, John Tanner. John, thanks for, for coming here. Just a, a quick thought about, about what might unite all three of those, even though they're taking up different positions, as well as those, Joseph Smith, the Brigham Young, probably before. There's this sense, even in Orson Pratt, it seems to me, that, that the, this isn't just Milton's chaos. They're, they're, the atoms are governed by, as you said, gravity. There's a sense that all matter exists within a, a framework of law. And that idea goes back to something that Joseph Smith would have, would have also ascribed to. It's in the Doctrine and Covenants. God would cease to be God in section 42, uh -huh. 15, and Second Nephi as well. There's a sense that God himself is obeying laws. And so I think Orson also has that. It's not just kind of, and there are, the illusion to gravity would be one that I think where we're signaling that there's something within which that matter is, is, is working, at least that would be my I think that's I, I think that's really important and, and really interesting. Uh, I, I just say one of yes, the, of course. I just encourage the audience to read Christian Doctrine. When I used to teach Milton, I try to do that. It is a remarkable work. Milton has given, and I just, I think we both agree with that. It, if, if Orson Pratt is really exciting, I think Mormons will find Christian doctrine amazing. It is amazing. Um, well, chapter 10, uh, which has an, uh, a long and uh, very dense and complicated uh, defense of, of polygamy is remarkable. But it, in the way that uh, book seven of uh, Paradise Lost is the book of creation, chapter seven of the treatise on Christian doctrine is the is his theory of creation, Milton's, and it, it and uh, it, it's one of many extraordinary parts of Milton's Milton's treatise. Um, the point about law is really interesting, and I thank you so much for those uh, uh, those pointers, those references to Joseph's um, understanding of our place in a world that's somehow governed by law. And Orson Pratt will say that is uh, say that is the case. But he goes, you know, he's perversely takes it one step further and will say that the atomic particles create the law that they then themselves agree to abide by. That's, um, that's you know, that uh, it, there's, it seems almost so deber deliberately perverse as if he's just, he wants to push it. I, I, don't, I, th I think on some level he just wants to, no. <laughs> Um, I frankly think uh, he kind of wants to get into trouble, but that's uh, it's 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 uh, it's taking something that seems appropriately revealed by the prophet, and then uh, just enough of a kind of spin on it that it becomes uh, indecorous. Yes. Although it does kind of answer a problem with God's obedience to law that goes back to Plato, 
between the laws that says, if God obeys law, why don't we cut out the middleman and worship law? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the Pratt would, would get around that. But I've got, I've got a different question, and that's on the political theology. Of this. Yes. Um, how Adams becomes libertarian and egalitarian when Milton's contemporary Hobbes, his atomism is in Tory monarchical authoritarian. How do, how do you interpret, you know, the one that, that started out as the other? No, that's interesting. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question about uh, Milton's Arch philosophical enemy, his contemporary Thomas Hobbes, the great uh, father of modern political philosophy. Um, yes, Hobbes is the father of authoritarianism, uh, but his uh, his his mechanistic vision of the movement of particles is essentially uh, they are inert. They have no intelligence and they have no uh, a capacity to move themselves. Things only move when they're forced to move by some kind of... He's a, he imagines always something like a, a, a billiard table where one ball hits the other and that's how all motion works. It's basically atomic particles in the Hobbesian state of nature. It's hell. And you need some kind of common power to keep everybody together. That's a, that's a useful question. Uh, yes, Andrea. Yes, yes. Remember, um, so I have a question. Um, this was so great to hear your presentation. Um, so... Obviously, book five is the important book that we're engaging with here. And I wondered how you plan to engage the lines um, uh, for 496 to 505, right? So, Raphael's telling Adam, right, it's the, the angel's diet, that, that section yes. of, of the speech, right? He says, and from these corporeal nutrients, perhaps your bodies may at last turn all to spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, improved by tract of time, and we descend ethereal as we or may at choice here, or in heavenly paradise as well, if ye be found obedient, mm -hmm. right, and retain unalterably firm his love and heart, his project of war. Um, meanwhile, enjoy your full happiness and majesty, and comprehend and capable of war. So I'm just very curious how you plan, because I feel like you have to address those lines. Absolutely. Talk about book five, right? Um, and so I'm just seeing kind of preliminary thoughts about no, it's a, uh, thank you. Um, so there is this remarkable part of Raphael's um, metaphysical disquisition with Adam um, that I didn't talk about. Um, and, and Milton's Raphael needs to supply Adam and Eve, unfallen still, with some kind of motive to stay obedient and virtuous. And so he tells them this, and this is obviously what passes as a truth in Milton's world. Um, if they remain obedient, uh, and if they continue to eat wisely, uh, there's a kind of weird nutritional element to this, too. Um, uh, if they continue to uh, in, in, take in the proper corporal nutriments, um, they will gradually rise. Um, the, the dense corporeal matter that constitutes their bodies will become increasingly rarefied and ethereal. They will sort of float up something like helium balloons. That's the only way I can read that passage. Until they, as Raphael says, you will winged ascend ethereal. They'll be angels. And it's going to be a gradual, seamless, beautiful um, continuum. But you have to stay obedient. Orson does take take that kind of ethical insistence, but he, he transposes the whole thing into material particles because that's what he's most uh, invested in. And the particles have to remain obedient if they're going to uh, get anything accomplished in terms of creating something truly great. And they actually, I don't understand how this, the logic of this, but there is a mechanism for their punishment when they disobey a law, for example, like gravity. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to understand everything that Orson writes. But I, he, I think he accommodates that aspect, that wonderful and weird aspect of Raphael's lesson. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes. So, Excuse me, we better make this the last question. Okay. Oh, um, no, I can ask you. <laughs> so I was just curious. So, but improved by track of time, can you argue though that Adam and Eve, until they partake of the fruits, that that's an historical time, time, right? And they can be improved, is established, right? Um, there, it, time as we know it starts at the fall. I mean, I, couldn't you argue that? That until, until, I mean, I think there's a lot of poetic evidence to suggest that they are in this sort of timelessness until they partake of it. Um, you, you are not alone in thinking that. Sure. 
but I, I, I have to respectfully uh, disagree. I think Milton um, is invested in the idea that there is a kind of temporal, um, an inescapable temporal frame that dominates uh, even, you know, way, way pre-existent heavenly life, you know, before the, the war in heaven. Um, even so, long before we even get to the creation of the of the world and and a paradise, it think there is a particular moment in time we learn in the Christian doctrine that God the Father creates uh, the the Son of God. Um, everything happens in a kind of a sequenced chronology. So yeah, I think that it certainly changes everything. Um, the the fall for, for for Milton in a way that it, as far as I can tell, doesn't really. Um, nearly so dramatically for the for the much bolder, much more radical thinkers in this early Mormon um, group, but uh, but but time is uh, time is important. Is it really over now? <laughs> time is important. <laughs> Time's important. Uh, thank you. So oh, yes. I think that you're going to have a question or two. I, I would be happy to be buttonholed. Yes. Uh, we are very grateful. Thank you. Read Orson Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the Pratt's whole spirit? <laughs> <laughs>